All right, we're going to continue uh, from yesterday. All right, uh, we were... All right, so we had our uh, trigonal bipyramidal. Anytime you have five directions. All right, so here we have our bonding directions, and here we have our lone pair directions. All right, and so when you add them up, that means you will have five directions, and that's why all of these are five total directions, uh, and then that is going to be a trigonal bipyramidal. All right, so that is the geometric arrangement. So the arrangement of the pairs, which I call the geometric arrangement. Again, I'm going to just say GA, that is your geometric arrangement. Uh, and for trigonal bipyramidal, I will put TBP for the abbreviation for trigonal bipyramidal. All right, so again, if they're all bonds, then it is what it is. You see everything. It is a trigonal bipyramidal. Uh, if one is a lone pair and that you cannot see in the molecular geometry, then we have a seesaw. Uh, if two of them, and again, they are going in the equatorial positions, lone pairs will always go in the equatorial positions. When two of them are in the equatorial position, then we have a T-shape. And then finally, if uh, three of those lone pairs are on your uh, trigonal bipyramidal, uh, then you have linear. And then we did a little of the bond angle. So now we only have the 180 degree bond angle. Here is 90, right there is 90. And then from here to here, you've got your 180. All right, this one's got them all. This one's got the 90 here, it's got the 180 here. And then between these two equatorials is 120. All right, and so for both of these, you have all the angles, which are 90, 120, and 180 for your bond angles. All right, so then we were going to six last time. All right, so not sure why they stop at uh, two lone pairs, but anyway, or maybe there's another slide. Nope. All right, so when you have your bonding pairs here, this is bonding. Bonding, I call them directions and lone pair. Directions, I call them directions because a double bond is, well, it's two bonds, but it's only one direction. All right, so bonding directions, a double bond is one direction. All right, so again, these are all going to add up to six. And when they add up to six, your bonding directions plus your lone pair directions, uh, you have octahedral. So your geometric arrangement is octahedral. And then I will put O lowercase h for my abbreviation for octahedral. If they're all bonds, then you see them all. And then the bonding, uh, the bond angles are 90 and 180. All right, so then when you have one lone pair, uh, the thing about the octahedral is they are all exactly the same. So it doesn't matter where you put the lone pair. It's exactly the same shape. There are no axial and equatorials. They are all exactly the same. And so when you have one, I always put it where they put it, on the bottom. And so then I see that I have a square base pyramid. And so that is called a square pyramidal. All right, now the second lone pair that goes in, it has to be as far away as possible. And that means on the opposite side. And so wherever you put your first pair, which it doesn't matter where you put it, I always put it at the bottom for an octahedral. Uh, the other one has to go to the opposite side. So the way I always do it is it's going to go uh, on the top. All right. And so then it's just a square and it's flat. So it is a square planar. All right. Now, when we have a six plus three, uh, what we're going to do here is I'm just going to put M for the middle. And the way you would draw an octahedral on a two-dimensional piece of paper is like this, which shows the square planar in the middle, and you got your up and your down. All right, so I already have one of my lone pairs here. I got another lone pair here. It doesn't matter 
where the next one goes. Right? So I'll put it in any of these places. And then that is a T-shape. Again, all of these have a bond of 9180 except for the next one that I do. And that, no, a 6 plus 3, that is a 3 plus 3. That gives you a 6, a 3 plus 3. All right, and so then we're going to do, for getting a 6, a 2 plus 4. And we're going to have four lone pairs of electrons. All right, and so when we do that, again, we draw exactly the same thing for octahedral every time. I put my first lone pair at the bottom. The second one then must go at the top. And then for the third one I picked here, once I pick there, I got to pick the other end of that, which is over here. Uh, and so then I have linear. And this one does not have the 90 degree bond angle. It only has the 180. All right, so I'm not sure why they didn't complete your uh, sixes here but uh, you can have a three plus three. You can also have a two plus four uh, for your octahedral. And then that would be a T-shape and a linear. All right. So let's see. Uh, now it's called VSEPR, valence shell electron pair repulsion. All right, that just means that the electrons are gonna get as far away from each other as possible. All right, so now we have to draw the Lewis structure and then match it up with our chart that we just went through. All right, so ASF3. All right, so you have uh, your uh, ASF3. So you're going to be given a periodic table, and you will see that AS is in the column with nitrogen and uh, phosphorus. And so it has group 5. So there are five valence electrons. Fluorine is the halogens. That has seven valence electrons. All right, you have three fluorines. So three times seven is 21 plus five. You have 26 valence electrons. Again, the first atom listed is the central atom. And so you will write your AS and then a bond to F, a bond to F, and a bond to F. We're drawing a Lewis structure. This is not to be drawn in three dimensions, not at this point. I'm just drawing a Lewis structure. All right, so when you add your three bonds, you got to subtract six electrons for the three bonds that we just put in. And then you have 20 valence electrons left. And you see that that is the perfect number to give all of your atoms an octet. Each one of these fluorines needs six more. That's 18. And then your AS in the middle needs another electron pair to give it an octet. And so we have the perfect number of electrons to give all the atoms an octet. All right, so the first question is going to be the geometric arrangement. Okay, uh, so the geometric arrangement is you have to see how many bonding directions you have. Well, we put in three bonding directions, so we have three bonding. And then you have to see how many lone pair. And we're looking at the central atom. One. And so you have four directions. And when you have four directions, your geometric arrangement is tetrahedral. All right, so now you can draw it in three dimensions. So now you can draw your tetrahedral. You have to know how to draw a tetrahedral. All right, and so when I have one lone pair, I like to put it on top. I get, all these places are exactly the same. Put it anywhere you want. They are all the same. It cannot be counted incorrect. It's just much easier to see what the shape is called if you put it on the top. All right, so if it says to draw the molecule in three dimensions, that's what this is. This is drawing the molecule in three dimensions. This is a Lewis structure. Uh, this looks like your bond angle is 120. No, your bond angle is not 120. It is a tetrahedral. Your bond angle is 109.5 degrees. All right, so that always goes together. If you have a geometric arrangement that's tetrahedral, the bond angle will be 109.5. All right, so now we want the molecular geometry. All right, and so you have to know what this shape is called. All right, you have a triangle base with all of your fluorines, and it's going up to the AS, so this is called a trigonal pyramidal.
trigonal planar would have a bond angle of 120. This is not a trigonal planar. This has a bond angle of 109.5. This is trigonal pyramidal. Again, the electron pair, you cannot see that. You're looking at the nucleus. There are four of them. The shape that that is uh, called is a trigonal pyramidal. All right, so we're going to go back because uh, I also asked for the hybrid orbital. HO is the hybrid orbital. All right, well, I guess we don't really have to go back. All right, so we have the S orbital, which has one orbital. That's the S. And then the P, there are three P orbitals. All right, and then, of course, we have the D orbitals, and there are five of them. All right, so when you have two directions, so two directions, uh, two directions will need two orbitals. All right, and so it's going to take the S orbital, and it's going to take one of the P's. So two direction is SP. Three directions, now we need three orbitals. So we take the S, and we take two P's. And that is called sp2. When you have four directions, which is what we have right up here, the question for ASF3, we need the s and we need all three of the p orbitals. And so that is sp3. When we have five directions and we do our trigonal bipyramidal, we need the s, we need the three p's, and we need a d orbital. And so that is sp3 and d. And when we have six directions, we need six orbitals. And so we're going to take the S, P, 3, and two of the Ds. All right, and so those are your hybrid orbitals. So if you are tetrahedral, then your hybrid orbital is always S, P, 3. You have four directions, you need four orbitals, because the direction requires two electrons, two electrons, two electrons, two electrons. An orbital holds two electrons, two electrons, two electrons, two electrons, right? So each orbital holds two electrons. And so you need four orbitals, an S and all three of the P's. All right, so when it asks for the hybrid orbital, that's it. If it's two directions, SP, three directions, SP2, four directions, SP3, five directions, SP3D, six directions, SP3D2. All right, now uh, we're going to do pH4 plus. All right, so now when you have a charge, remember, if you have a plus charge, you lose an electron. If you have a negative charge, you need to add an electron. You gain an electron. All right, and so when you do the P, which is in period in group five, all right, and then H, which each has one, so plus four, you have to know that when you have a plus charge, you have to subtract one electron. So nine minus one, here you have eight valence electrons. So then you do your pH, your pH, your pH, your pH, your four pH bonds, P is the central atom. So that subtracts eight and you're done. Everything has an octet, that is perfect. All right, now for the plus charge to find out where the plus charge is. Again, you can go through their equation and do all that work and that's fine. That's the way you wanna do it. I will never do it that way. All right, so I know that P should have brought in five because I wrote it down right here. And when I look, I see that P brought in one, two, three, four electrons. And so I know that P did not bring in enough electrons. That is why the P has the plus charge. It was supposed to bring in five. It only brought in four. It has lost an electron and it is positive. H, each one of these H's should have brought in one. Each one of these H's, yes. Each one of these H's brought in one electron. That is a neutral H to form a covalent bond. One electron from the P has to then uh, share with one electron from the H. So the P should have brought in five, it only brought in four. That's why it is the plus charge. All right, so here we just have uh, four bonding directions. We have a four plus zero. So your geometric arrangement, again, tetrahedral. That means your bond angle, again, 109.5. Uh, and now your molecular geometry, when this is a zero, lone pairs, then these are the same. 
Anytime you have zero for your lone pairs, then your geometric arrangement is exactly the same as your molecular geometry. And only when you have zero lone pairs is that the same. All right, and so then we draw it in three dimensions. So again, you have to be able to draw a tetrahedral. Uh, if you leave it, this is a great Lewis structure. All right, it does not show three dimensions because looks like all the bond angles there are 90. They are not, they are 109.5. And so you have to draw it in three dimensions in order to see the 109.5 degree bond angle. It doesn't have to be perfect 109, you have to get a protractor. Uh, but anyway, the bond angles are 109.5. All right, so this one is interesting, BCL3. All right, so B has three. That's uh, in group three, so three valence electrons. And then, of course, the halogens have seven. All right, so you got 24 valence electrons. Uh, and so you have your boron bonded to three chlorines. So we subtract six and then we have then 18 electrons left. And so is 18 enough electrons to give everything an octet? Well, the answer here is no. And it all depends on what the question is. All right. So we need 20. So that means that we need a double bond. However, if you remember when you had your lithium, beryllium, then your boron, which is next, uh, then your carbon. Remember that in compounds, these three rarely have an octet, all right? So this is uh, normally less than an octet. Any lithium is always less than an octet. Uh, and so boron many times is less than an octet, which is what you have here. So you have to look at the question. So uh, if the question doesn't say it has to have an octet, then this is your answer. All right, why is this your answer? Well, chlorine was supposed to bring in seven. It brought in seven. All right, each one of these chlorines brought in seven electrons, as we wrote right here that each chlorine brings in seven. Yes, each chlorine brought in seven. This one says the boron should have brought in three, and we see right here that the boron brought in three electrons, and so it is neutral. Uh, if it said that you must have an octet, then we don't have enough electrons and we would have to add a pi bond. All right. So the only time you would have to do that is if it said you have to have a pi bond. Now, note, all of the answers are going to be the same regardless of which resonance structure you draw. Geometric arrangement. We have three bonding directions. All right. And so that is trigonal planar. Trigonal planar has a bond angle of 120. All right, the molecular geometry, since there are no lone pairs on the central atom, then these are the same, trigonal planar. All right, and then your uh, hybrid orbital, all right, you have three directions, all right, and so that needs sp2 for your hybrid orbital. All right, let's see. I'm pretty sure that's what they're going to do. Let's see if that's what they do. All right, yes. All right, so they aren't going to mention that this doesn't have an octet. Nope, not going to mention that. Okay. All right, so if it says that all atoms must have an octet, if, big if, it says all atoms must have an octet, All right, so if it says that, then this is the wrong answer. Uh, if it says that, now you have to draw the three resonance structures. So remember where we were at, all right? So we had 24, we subtracted six, we had 18. 18 didn't give boron an octet. We needed 20 to give everything an octet. That means we have to add a pi bond, all right? And so then you put one of them has a double bond, to the chlorine and the other two are single bonds. All right. But it doesn't have to be that one. It could be the one on the right double bond to chlorine. 
or of course it could have been the one at the bottom all right and so then if this is the question it says uh, it must have an octet uh, the reason why I'm doing it is because of two reasons one I want you to do the three resonance structures uh, and two these are not all neutral anymore and so when we put in all of our electrons all right so we didn't subtract let's subtract the uh, two for the pi bond so we have 16 electrons and when we count them one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen that is the perfect number of electrons to give all atoms an octet except now we see that the boron if we draw it this way had to bring in four electrons it was only supposed to bring in three electrons and so this boron has a negative charge all right so this chlorine was supposed to bring in seven and it did it brought in seven there are the seven this chlorine was supposed to bring in seven it, yes it brought in seven this chlorine was supposed to bring in seven this chlorine only brought in six and so this chlorine has a plus charge so every double bond to chlorine has a plus charge all of the borons here have a negative charge all right and that makes it then neutral all right so uh, all of these answers are correct there is nothing incorrect about them unless it says all atoms must have an octet if it says that then these are the only correct answers if it doesn't say anything then all of these are the correct answers uh, if it says give the four resonance structures, well, then you have to give this one and these three. These are four resonance structures. All right, so resonance structures are just uh, Lewis structures of the same uh, compound. All right, so, um, so your bond order... All right, so for the octet, if it was just draw three resonance structures, we draw four. Uh, so if it says draw the four resonance structures, all right, and so we drew all four of them, and then it says draw the resonance hybrid. All right, so what you do here is you have your boron, and then you have your three chlorines, and then you put dot, 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 dot. That just means that you have partial bonds. But then it's going to ask for the bond order. So given that there are four resonance structures and you wrote the resonance hybrid, assuming that all of these are equal in uh, stability, you want to find the bond order. All right, so you have to add it up. So in this one, all of these bond orders, we're going to go to the one on the left. Bond order is one. The one on the left. Bond order is two. Remember, if it's a double bond, the bond order is two. Bond order here, one. If the bond order is one, that's a single bond. Single bond. Bond order is one. All right, so then you add them up and divide by four. So one plus one plus two plus one. That is five over four. So your bond order is five fours. So you add them all up and divide by the number of times you added a number. So you added a one, a two, a one, and a one. There was four structures. When you have four resonance structures, you are going to be dividing by four. All right? You added up four numbers, a one, a two, a one, and a one. So the bond order, every single one of these is going to be three ones and a two. So the bond order is five fours. So this just shows a partial uh, which is now, you know, one and one fourth or five fourths. Uh, then it's going to say give the charges. So the bond order, five fourths for our four resonance structures. Uh, the charges. All right, let's look at boron. Boron, neutral in this first one. So that's zero. If we want to write down the charge, zero. And then it's minus one here. It's minus one here. It's minus one here. Plus, minus one, plus, minus one, plus, minus one. All right, so you're going to have your four numbers from your four resonance structures. So it is minus three out of the four structures. And so your boron is minus three fours. Now we do the chlorines. 
chlorine up here. We'll go to the one on the left. One on the left, no charge for that one. The one on the left, plus charge. No charge, no charge. So we add them up. Zero plus one plus zero plus zero divided by four. And so our charge is a positive one-fourth. So every chlorine has a positive one-fourth. All right, and so then overall you're neutral. You have three plus one fours and a minus three fours. And so it is neutral. So the hardest questions on the test are gonna to be to give the resonance structures and then give the resonance hybrid, give the bond order and give the charge for your resonance hybrid. They cannot get any harder than that one. All right, so if we're doing ICL3, again, you got seven, and then you have three times seven. So you got 28 valence electrons. Central atom is I, bonded to three chlorines. When you put in three bonds of chlorine, you gotta subtract six for the three bonds. Each bond is two electrons, 22. So in order to give everything an octet, we need six around each chlorine, that's 18, and we need two here. We only need 20. We have two extra. Remember what to do with extra ones. The extra ones we put on the central atom. All right, and so your Lewis structure has three bonds and two lone pairs. All right, and so that is equal to five directions. All right, so your geometric arrangement is trigonal by pyramidal. So now we draw it in three dimensions. Trigonal by pyramidal, you have to know how to draw a trigonal by pyramidal. That is how you draw a trigonal by pyramidal. Now you have to know how to put in the lone pairs of electrons. They must, for trigonal bipyramidal, they must go in the equatorial positions. And so you're putting both sets of lone pairs in the equatorial position. And then you put in your CL, your CL, and your CL. And then you put the electron pairs around your chlorines. All right, and so now we see that our molecular geometry, oh, okay, yeah. So then molecular geometry is a T shape. Letter T shape. All right, and so then the bond angles. So you can't do bond angles until you do molecular geometry for uh, five and six directions. Uh, really just five directions, six directions, is almost always 90 and 180. Uh, but for five directions, you cannot do the bond angle until after your molecular geometry because there's no 120 anymore. It sees a T-shape. T-shape only has a 90 and a 180 degree bond angle. 90 here and then 180 here to here. That's all it's got. And so then your hybrid orbital, anytime you have five directions, you have to have five orbitals. You need the S, you need all three P's, and you need a D. 1s, 3p, 1d, five orbitals for five directions. sp3d is your hybrid orbital. All right, uh, so the chlorine should have brought in seven. It brought in seven, neutral. Chlorine should have brought in seven, brought in seven, neutral. Chlorine should have brought in seven, brought in seven, neutral. What about the iodine? The iodine doesn't look normal. All right, let's check it out. Iodine was supposed to bring in seven, and it brought in three that it shared, plus four it didn't share, and that is seven. And so that is also a neutral iodine. So everything here uh, is neutral. All atoms are neutral there. All right, when you have an ICL4 minus, well, something is going to have a minus charge. All right, so we add up our electrons. Seven plus seven times four, and then we have a negative charge. You have to add another electron, all right? And so that is 36. So you have 36 valence electrons. 
Central atom is the first atom listed. That is your I. It is bonded to four chlorines. So we subtract eight and we have 28. And we need six for each one of these chlorines. All right, so that is 24. We don't need any for the iodine. We have four extra electrons. Again, when you have extra electrons, they go on the central atom. So the four extra electrons go on the central atom. And so now you see that you have four bonding directions and you have two lone pair directions. All right, so that is six. And so here we have a geometric arrangement of octahedral. Uh, if we're going to do the charges, we see that all these chlorines brought in seven, and it was supposed to bring in seven. All the chlorines are neutral. The iodine was supposed to also bring in seven. It brought in four that it shared, and it also has four that it is not sharing. They are lone pairs. That is a total of eight electrons that the iodine brought in and the iodine has the negative charge. <clears throat> All right, so your geometric arrangement is octahedral. That means your hybrid orbital. You have to have six orbitals, and so that is sp3d2 for the six orbitals. And now you got to figure out your molecular geometry. Uh, in order to get the molecular geometry, you either memorize it or you draw it, and you're going to have to draw it anyway, so I'm going to draw it. So you have to draw a octahedral. So you have to know how to draw an octahedral. All octahedrals are drawn the same way. This is the way. I have two lone pairs. I always put my first one on bottom. Doesn't matter where you put it. I always put mine on bottom. And then the second one has to be opposite wherever you put your first ones. So it doesn't matter where you put the first one, but the second one has to go opposite the first one. And then you have your CL on all the four remaining spots. <clears throat> and you have a square planar. And then your bond angle for all but one of your octahedrals are 90 and 180. The only one that's only 180 is the one that has four lone pairs and the shape is linear. All right, uh, note that when we are predicting our 109.5 for our uh, tetrahedral, they're showing a bunch of tetrahedrals. All right, when you have a, uh, a methyl chloride, CH3Cl, the bond angle is slightly larger at 110. Uh, when you have your NH3, it is slightly smaller at 107. If you have water, it is slightly smaller at 105. Uh, I am not going to have you memorize the exact bond angle. Uh, we're going to say the bond angle is 109.5, and we will know that there's going to be some deviation to that. All right, so uh, it might not be exactly 109.5, but if it's CH4, like this one is, CH4, everything's exactly the same around the central atom, then it will be exactly 109.5. But when you have different atoms around the carbon, all right, at one chlorine and three H's, uh, it may have a different bond angle than the 109.5. Uh, and when you are uh, a uh, four directions and one is an electron pair, many times that's smaller. However, if you put large atoms here, that bond angle can get larger than 109.5. So anytime we have a geometric arrangement that is tetrahedral, we're going to say that the bond angle is 109.5 degrees. All right, so this is interesting because here we have three directions. And this is why I call them directions, because we have four bonds. 
but it's not four directions. That's one direction, that's one direction, and going to the right is just one direction. All right, and so you have three directions, which means that you are trigonal planar. All right, and so a trigonal planar, your bond angle again is 120. Now, not every single one that is trigonal planar has exactly a 120 degree bond angle. But again, 120 is what we're going to call it, and it's going to be very close to 120. It may not be exactly 120. Uh, if you had the exact same three bonds, then it would be exactly 120. But if you have different things on there, like two H's and an O, uh, you're not going to get exactly 120 for your bond angle. All right. And this is then SP2. Again, three directions here. Direction this way, direction this way, direction this way. This is SP2, bond angle 120 again. It's 117, not exactly 120. All right, so dipole moment, figuring out the dipole moment. I think this is probably the hardest thing to do in this chapter. Uh, for one, you have to know if the bond is polar and which way you're going to write uh, the delta plus delta minus. So if you had a C with an F, F is always nice because it is a very large, the largest electronegativity. Uh, and then carbon is 2.5. And so we always know that the electrons, and this arrow is showing the electrons, are closer to the F, always closer to the F than any other atom. All right. And so that means that since the electrons are closer to the F, the F has a partial minus, And then whatever it is connected to, in this case, a carbon, uh, would be a delta plus. All right, and so this is a bond dipole. All right, we are going to do a dipole moment for a molecule. We're going to have what is called a molecular dipole. All right, and that is for an entire molecule. A bond dipole is for each individual bond. The molecular dipole is for an entire molecule. All right, so again, here you got your 3.0 for your electronegativity of chlorine. You got your 2.1 for your electronegativity of hydrogen. You have the uh, row that you have to have the numbers memorized for, plus the hydrogen, uh, and you have your halogen column that you need to know, plus your sulfur and your phosphorus. All right, and so we know that this is polar. Always, the electrons are always closer to the higher electronegativity, and so... We, I like to draw an arrow showing that the electrons are moving closer to the chlorine. That's why the chlorine is delta minus, and that's why the hydrogen is delta plus. Those deltas indicate partial charges, not a full plus one and minus one. <clears throat> All right, so if we look at CO2, all right, so this is a 3.5, this is a 2.5, this is a 3.5. And so we have our arrows going to, we know that the electrons are going to be closer to the O. And so we have delta minus, we have delta minus, and the carbon is delta plus. All right, so the delta minuses to the higher electronegative atoms, delta plus to the lower electronegative atoms. All right, and so when you're doing your bond dipoles, these are very strong bond dipoles, difference of 1.0 when you subtract those. All right, but when you do the molecular dipole, you have to look at where is the center of plus? It is right on the carbon. Where is the center of minus? It is also right on the carbon. All right, so center of delta plus and delta minus is at carbon. Therefore, it is a nonpolar molecule. All right, so it has bond dipoles that are very polar, but the actual molecule has a dipole moment of zero. And so it is usually as a mu, your dipole moment for your molecule 
is a mu, and that's equal to zero. That's when your dipole moment is zero. All right, when you look at water, the reason why water is bent is when you do the Lewis structure and you see that you have two bonding directions and two lone pair directions, you know that water has a geometric arrangement of tetrahedral. So when you draw that as a tetrahedral, you've got a 109.5 degree, and we just saw on the last slide, the, for water, the actual bond angle is 105, but it's tetrahedral. Uh, if you know and want to give the exact uh, bond angle, fine, uh, but I'm looking for the bond angle is 109.5. All right, and so then we have to see what our electronegativities are. So hydrogen, 2.1, oxygen, 3.5. And so your oxygen is much more electronegative than your hydrogen. And so you point the arrow to the oxygen. So each hydrogen is delta plus. And this oxygen is delta minus. All right, but note that there is nothing more electronegative than an electron pair. But also note that the electron pairs are right up next to your oxygen. And so you draw a little tiny arrow that says that the electrons are going to go out towards those electron pairs. All right. And so not sure why they're drawing that. I like to draw it right here. So the center of delta plus, you're looking for the center of delta plus. It is right there. That is the center of delta plus. So it is here's delta plus, there's delta plus right in the middle. The center of delta minus, I will circle it. It's right here, just right on top of your oxygen, a little further than the oxygen because the electron pairs pull out a little of the uh, electrons. And so this is the center of delta minus. And so uh, when you're drawing this, you always draw from the center of delta plus to the center of delta minus. Instead of sticking it in the middle of all this stuff, I put it out to the side. All right. They're putting it up above. I don't like that because I like to show that my arrow is trying to start here at the center of delta plus, And it's going to here, the center of delta minus. I'm not going to get out a ruler and measure it, but uh, I'm trying to estimate that this is going from the center of delta plus to the center of delta minus in my molecule. And so this is polar. And so here we just say that, well, the, di the, the dipole moment is not zero. All right, so it is polar. So this is nonpolar. And this one is polar. All right, so you have to give all of the bond dipoles. Then you got to find the center of all of your minuses. You got to find the center of all of your pluses and see if there's a separation. If there's a separation, then it has a dipole moment. If there is no separation because the center of plus and the center of minus, if it's in the exact same place, then there's no separation between the center of plus and minus and the dipole moment is zero and you have a nonpolar molecule. All right, so I just like to calculate it each time. Uh, here's just a list of things that can never be uh, zero. Uh, black hole moment, zero, square planar, zero. And they're just saying if all four things are exactly the same. All right, so if you had any of these where uh, that's not a chlorine and that's not two chlorines or fluorines or whatever, uh, if you had chlorines and fluorines, then that's not true. If it's only fluorines or only chlorines, then these things can be true. So this is not that helpful, but I'm not going to go through that. But anyway, uh, you can look through that if that's helpful. Um, all right, so then we're going to look at boiling point. Uh, and so the if you have a boiling point, you're looking for uh, something that is polar is going to have a higher boiling point. It has to break up those forces in order to uh, vaporize the molecule. All right. And so when you're looking at uh, two similar compounds, uh, so here you have a cis-1,2-dichloroethene and here you have a trans-1,2-dichloroethene. 
All right, it looks like it's going to be the same. Here's a carbon bonded to an H, a chlorine, and double bonded carbon. Here's a carbon bonded to an H, a chlorine, double bonded. So you're going to say the same thing. However, note that in this one, the chlorines are on the same side of that double bond, and double bonds do not have free rotation. And here, the chlorines are on opposite sides of the double bond. And so they are different in their geometry, and that's why they are then called cis and trans, which we will get into next semester. All right, so what we need to know here are the electronegativities. Uh, 3.0, 2.5, 2.1. Those are your electronegativities that you have memorized from the chart. All right, and so when we look at our bond dipoles, we always point to the higher electronegative number. Not sure why they're doing it wrong. Okay. All right, pointing the wrong way. So you have to point to the higher electronegative atom. Point to the higher electronegative atom. Always point to the higher electronegative atom. All right, and so what we're going to find is that we're going to have our delta pluses out at the lowest electronegativity, the hydrogens, and we're going to have the minus at the higher electronegativity, and that is the chlorines. And so when we look for our center of plus, it's going to be right between the hydrogens and right between the chlorines for the delta minus. So here is your center of delta plus. Here is your center of delta minus, and your dipole moment goes here. All right, and so that is polar. Now, when we go over here, and the lowest is the hydrogen, so that's delta plus, delta plus. Uh, the highest number is chlorine. That's your delta minus. That's your delta minus. And so then we find the center of delta minus, and it is right here, right between those two chlorines. The center of delta plus it is in the exact same place, right between the two delta pluses, the hydrogens here. And so since there is zero uh, distance between your center of delta plus and de delta minus, it's the exact same spot for both of them, then this is nonpolar. This one has a difference between the center of plus and the center of minus. This one is polar. All right, and so when you are going to boil something, you have to break all of these interactions, these dipole-dipole interactions. And so this is going to have a higher boiling point. All right, you would not be able to predict what the boiling point was, but they could say that one of these has a boiling point of 60 and the other one has a boiling point of 48. Well, we know this one has the higher boiling point and 60 is higher than 48. And so then you would know the boiling point. Otherwise, you would not need to know what the actual boiling point is, but if they give you that one of these boils at 60 and one at 48, well, this one's gonna boil at the higher boiling point, which is the 60, and this one would boil at the lower boiling point, which is 48, because this one has a polar, this one is a polar molecule, and polar molecules will always have a higher boiling point than a nonpolar molecule, uh, given that the molar masses are uh, essentially the same, and these are exactly the same molar masses. All right, so we have two molecules. We have AX3, have different dipole moments. One has a dipole moment of zero, whereas molecule Z has a non-zero dipole moment. So we have a polar and a nonpolar of Y and Z. So uh, so your AX3, all right? So when you have three, all right? So we could be uh, trigonal planar, all right? If you're trigonal planar, then this would be, again, if you're trigonal planar and X and X, I'm, I'm not having X, Y, and Z, this is X. All three of these are the same. So that'd be three fluorines, three chlorines, all right? And so this one would be, uh, perfectly symmetrical and have a uh, zero dipole moment, which means it is nonpolar. Uh, but if we had uh, AX3 and we had an electron pair, all right, so then we're tetrahedral. 
all right, with one of these being electron pair. And so this one is going to be not zero. So X, 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 it's not completely symmetrical. You have an electron pair, all right? And so this one would be, so this one's nonpolar. This one is polar, all right? We could have A, X, three and have two electron pairs. So now we have five directions and electron pair here and here, we have T-shape, all right? And there's no way for T-shape to be perfectly symmetrical. And so this one can never be zero. This one is polar. And we could have AX3 where we have three electron pairs, all right? And then that one would also, well, this one be uh, your octahedral. And so again, the first doesn't matter where you put it. Second one goes opposite. And then third one here, again, this is T-shape. So this is T-shape. This one is T-shape. All right, no way to be perfectly symmetrical with T-shape. And so again, this one uh, is going to be polar. All right, and so you have three choices for polar and one choice from your a uh, nonpolar. So we know the one that's zero. The one that's zero is got to be trigonal planar. That's the only one that can be zero. All right. But the other one, well, it could be uh, it could be your tetrahedral where you have a trigonal pyramidal. Uh, it could also be uh, five directions where it is T-shaped. It could also be six directions where it's T-shaped. They're probably not going to give this one as an answer since they didn't have it on their chart. Uh, but there are three choices for the polar. There's only one choice for the nonpolar. It has to be a trigonal planar where you have perfectly symmetrical X's around the A. All right, so uh, trigonal pyramidal T-shape, Y is likely to be trigonal planar, but might be trigonal pyramidal or T-shape. What? No. Okay. Uh, trigonal planar is the only one where the dipole moment is zero, and I'm not sure what their answer down here is. The only one that can be zero is trigonal planar. Uh, trigonal pyramidal, always non-zero. T-shape, always non-zero. I don't know what this can be crap is, but it's always non-zero. It can be a small, but it is not zero. All right, so which of the following molecules would be expected to have a zero dipole moment? So again, we're going to answer uh, all of our questions that we have for this. So fine. All right, so we look at the periodic table. GE is under carbon, so it has four valence electrons. Uh, your fluorine uh, has seven times four. That's 28 plus four is 32. So we have 32 valence electrons for GEF4. So our central atom is GE bonded to four Fs. We subtract eight, we get 24, and 24 is the perfect number to give all of the fluorines an octet. All right, and so we have our geometric arrangement is tetrahedral, our hybrid orbital is sp3. For our four directions, you need four orbitals. Molecular geometry is exactly the same because there are no lone pairs on GE, so that's tetrahedral. And then the bond angle for tetrahedral is 109.5 degrees. Now we have to do the dipole moment. So we have to draw it in three dimensions. So we have to draw a tetrahedral. Put in the F, the F, the F, and the F. All right, and what's nice is we don't need to know the electronegativity of GE. We got F, and so we know that F is always the highest electronegativity, no matter what it is bonded to. 
F is always delta minus. And then GE is delta plus. All right, so those are showing your bond dipoles. All right, but now we see that the delta minuses are perfectly surrounding the GE. All right, and so the center of delta plus is right at GE, and the center of delta minus is again exactly at the GE. So the center of delta plus and center minus are in the same place. And therefore, your dipole moment is zero. This is non-polar. All right, so GEF4 is non-polar. All right, so if we did SF2, so that is 6 plus 14, that is 20. All right, so we have our S, we have our F, we have our F. So 20 minus 4 is 16. Our 16 valence electrons, enough to give everything an octet, and that is a yes. It is the perfect number to give all of the atoms an octet. And so now we see our central atom has two bonding directions and two lone pair directions. So again, our geometric arrangement is tetrahedral. Our hybrid orbital is sp3. But our molecular geometry, we do not have this shape. All right, so note, this is a fine Lewis structure to draw. That is not showing three dimensions because I know that when I am tetrahedral, that my bond angle is going to be 109.5. There is no way my bond angle is going to be this 180 degree bond angle. You must draw it in three dimensions. And so you have your tetrahedral that you have to know how to draw. You put your F, your F, your electron pair, your electron pair. All right. F is always the most electronegative. F is always the most electronegative. And remember that your electron pairs are really close to the S, but they are pulling the electrons out very, very small amounts. All right, and so you have a delta minus here, you've got a delta minus here, and then you got a delta minus here, and you got a delta minus here. Uh, and then the uh, sulfur is where your delta plus is. All right, so the center of delta minus, well, it would be right between the Fs, but it's going to be slightly to the inside of that. So I'm going to move it in a little bit. So normally it would be, say, here between the two Fs, maybe. Uh, it's going to come uh, down a little bit because you have a, a small delta minus coming out there and there. All right, but the electron pair does not pull out the exact same distance as the F does. All right, and so the center of delta minus is still to the upper right. Center of delta plus is right on the S. And so you have a dipole moment that goes this way. And so all you can say here is that this is polar. You can say that the uh, dipole moment is not zero. All right, XEF2. All right, so on here, I'm going to do XEF2. All right, so that's a noble gas. 8 plus 7 times 2 is 14. We have 22 valence electrons with the central atom being XE bonded to an F, bonded to an F. So again, two bonds, subtract four electrons, two electrons for each bond. 18, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. We have two extra electrons. All right, and so again, the extra electrons will always go on our central atom. All right, we should always check to see that uh, we are neutral. And so uh, F should have brought in seven, as we have here, seven, two times is 14. So again, the F, each F brought in seven. XE should have brought in eight. There is six for the lone pairs plus the one for this bond and the one for that bond. All right, so everything is neutral. All right, so we have two bonding directions and we have three lone pair directions. And so our uh, shape 
our geometric arrangement is trigonal by pyramidal, five directions. All right, and so our hybrid orbital is S, P, 3, and D. We have five directions. We need five orbitals, one S, three P's, and a D. All right, so now we have to draw it in three dimensions to get the molecular geometry and the bond angle. So you have to know how to draw a trigonal by pyramidal. All right, and so you also have to know where to put the electron pairs. The electron pairs have to go in the equatorial position. And so the F here and the F here. So this is drawing the molecule in three dimensions. And so your molecular geometry is linear. And your bond angle is 180. All right, and when you do your arrows, you always point to the fluorines. Fluorines are always delta minus. All right, and then your electron pairs are very close to the XE. So that's a delta minus really close to the XE, delta minus close to the XE, uh, and delta minus very close to the XE. It, is taking electrons out, but again, a very small distance because the electron pairs are right next to that atom. All right, and so our center of delta plus is right here on the Xe. So the center of delta plus right on the Xe. So the F, the two delta minuses for the F go right to the Fe, that's where the delta minus is. And all of these perfectly surround the center for the center of delta minus from those three to be exactly on the Xe. And so this is nonpolar. The delta plus, the center of delta plus and delta minus is on the Xe. And so that is a nonpolar molecule. All right, so we have ASF3. So AS in column five. And then we have F3, seven times three is 21. We have 26 valence electrons. So we're gonna have our AS, we're gonna bond it to three Fs. And we subtract six. We have 20 electrons. That is the perfect number to give everything an octet. All right, so we see we, see we have three bonding directions and one lone pair direction. So we have four directions. So our geometric arrangement is tetrahedral. The hybrid orbital is sp3. Then we have to draw it in three dimensions. So we have to be able to draw a tetrahedral, AS, and then your tetrahedral. Uh, when I have one electron pair on tetrahedral, I like to put it on top. Doesn't matter where you put it. You can go anywhere. All the spots are exactly the same on a tetrahedral. All right, and so you have uh, a molecular geometry of trigonal parameter with a bond angle of 109.5 degrees. All right, and so when you're doing your bond dipoles, very simple when you have F because there is nothing more electronegative than F. And so you point your arrow at the higher electronegative F Every F will always get a delta minus. Again, when you have an electron pair, it's going to pull the electrons out, but just barely. They are very close to the atom. All right, so your center of delta minus is just below the AS. So the center of delta minus is just below your AS. The center of delta plus is right on your AS. And so you do have a separation for your dipole. And so your mu is not equal to zero. You have a polar molecule. So you don't have to know the numbers here. All you have to know are the trends uh, to know where to draw your arrow. Always draw it to the more electronegative atom. You don't need a number. You don't have to have a subtraction. 
Um, anytime you got fluorine, you know it is the highest electronegativity. It is always delta minus. All right, so hybrid orbitals. I talked a little bit. HO, that's hybrid orbitals. Again, SP for two directions, SP2, three directions, SP3, four directions, SP3D, five directions, SP3D2, six directions. All right, so that is your hybrid orbitals. All right, so it's used to describe the bonding uh, when you are uh, making these molecules. So again, sp just means you're taking 1s orbital, 1p orbital, sp2, 1s, 2ps, and so forth and so on. All right, so again, anytime you have two directions, sp, three directions, sp2, four directions, sp3, five directions, sp3d, six directions, sp3d2. All right, so here are the pictures, all right? So this is... Uh, uh, the way I do this, I realize that's the picture. That's not the way I draw it because I prefer to draw it like this. Okay, so when I'm drawing it, I'm going to draw it like this. And then I will write SP and I will write SP. That's how I will draw an SP hybrid orbital. SP2, I will write it this way. And I will write SP2. And I will write SP2. And I will write SP2. All right, uh, and then here again, I will just write SP3 in each one of these, SP3, SP3, <clears throat> SP3. Uh, the way I would do that one, though, is with, in order to uh, know that it's tetrahedral on a two-dimensional board, I don't draw the tetrahedron, I put a dash and a wedge, and I write SP3. All right, same thing here. You do your uh, trigonal bipyramidal. And then in each one of these, I write SP3D. All right, so all these are SP3D. And then over here with your octahedral, You write SP3D2 and all of these, SP3D2, SP3D2, SP3D2. All right, so they didn't list the hard ones, at least not yet. We will see. So here we have the S and then we have the P's. All right. When you do SP, you have the S and you have the P, but you have then two unhybridized P orbitals. So two unhybridized P orbitals, which are the PY and the PZ. So the PY is here when we drew our 2PY, all right? So that's what the PY looked like. And then remember the PZ, that meant one was going back, one was coming out. This was the PZ and the PZ. So we have two unhybridized orbitals. When you have your SP2, all right, you hybridize two of the P orbitals and you have one unhybridized. P orbital. All right, and so that I like to always call PY, but it doesn't have to be. It's PY or it's PZ. And now it's not both. This one is both. You're going to have your PY and your PZ. This one is you pick one. PY, if you want the, uh, if you want it to be the PY, great. Then it's up and down. If you want it to be the PZ, great. Then it's in and out. All right, so I normally pick the PY, but sometimes there is no choice. Uh, most of the time there is a choice. When there's a choice, I always use PY. I prefer it to be in the plane that I can see and not in and out of the page. All right. 
trying to see if the All right, and so we will draw pictures like this next time. All right, we have lab tomorrow. Uh, and